Um, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, before we, uh, before I bring out uh, the guest, who could it be? Um, uh, who could, uh, oh, it's there. Um, uh, there's an app. Have we all got the app? If you've got the app, if you want to ask questions, then they'll come through on this magical iPad. I've been told if you send through hateful ones, they'll be edited out before they get there. But actually, send them in, because I want to read them. Um, uh, re send any questions for the app, and I'll just bring on the guests. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, please welcome. She's an MP. She is from Birmingham. She managed to get a street in Birmingham in Vogue magazine recently. She uh, uses the House of Commons as a stand-up gig, and she once told Diane Abbott to fuck off. Please welcome Jess Phillips. <laughs> Hello. So what are you stockpiling for Brexit? <laughs> uh, I have actually got Japati flour. Uh, just because you can't, uh, you can only buy it by the sort of 10 kilogram anyway. Mm. So we've had that for a, a while. And basmati rice. And I've got rhubarb in the garden. So, so you'll be fine. We'll have chapatis, rice and rhubarb, yeah. Sounds like an absolutely horrendous dinner party, that. <laughs> are you, but are you, but where think... we live, uh, we're going to be all right in Birmingham because, I mean, the, the Asian community that we live amongst... I mean, they've been stockpiling for general, you know, when yeah. you go to people's houses and instead of a bottle of olive oil, they've got an actual, like, vat of olive oil. Yeah. So we're going to be all right, I think, where we live. There's plenty to go around. Do you think we should stockpile? Just because I heard that an unnamed former editor of The Guardian is stockpiling. But he is stockpiling, this is what I heard, he's stockpiling cannellini beans, olive oil and white wine. I thought that's <laughs> the most Guardian thing I've ever heard in my life. Should I, we? I mean, if he's doing it, should we? Um, I, I, I don't think that we need to stockpile at the moment, um, apart from that it will improve this quarter of the economy and mean that we won't go into an official recession because we're currently avoiding an official recession because people stockpiled the last time they thought we were going to leave. Oh, I see. Um, and it boosted, is that why, is that actually it boosted why the economy for that quarter um, because people stockpiled. But um, I've got a Costco card, so I can uh, stop our well. But no, I, I don't. I, look, I, I don't think. I don't think that we will. Um, I really hope we don't leave on the 31st of October. So I don't feel the need to stockpile at the moment, and I, I don't think. Will you let us know when you do? Yes. I mean, it's people. It's things like um, the worst thing is, is that we've only got six weeks worth of the chemicals that it takes to keep our drinking water clean for the nation because we buy it in and we don't have the storage capacity for it. Right. So... So we need to stockpile stock water. Stock, I mean, I wouldn't stockpile water, uh, but maybe that, those chemicals. We could all be renting out our fridges, couldn't we, to whoever it is who gets in that stuff. Defra. Right. Michael Gove. Is it Mike? I can't remember who's who anymore in politics. Who's that? Um... Uh, let's move on to, because uh, as it's the TV festival, you were on TV quite a bit, mm -hmm. and you recently did Celebrity Bake Off, and I we did. have a little clip of you. Let's watch it now. You won! I did win. I didn't win. I was robbed by Melanie Sykes, the bitch. I and I felt that actually it came across that you were quite annoyed about it. I'm still livid about it to this day. Um, it was a very low bar, Joe. I mean, at one point somebody turned to me, I shan't say who, and said, what's this? And it was an onion. <laughs> so I was like, that you was... know, I have eaten food before, so I didn't know what some of the food was. That was Paul Hollywood, wasn't it? <laughs> wasn't it? Well, I mean, he definitely relished Oh, he totally into... relished cutting into the cake. Uh, and, yeah, I did at one point have to say, I hope you don't choke on my patriarchy cake. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, he, he definitely relished smashing my face. <laughs> my cake face. What, um, I, doing things like that, it, Boris is our Prime Minister, and he was sort of started, I suppose, with doing things like, have I got news for you, and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Is that sort of your tactic? Are you Not to go down the Boris route of... <laughs> His politics, but like to Boris. kind of uh, um, endear yourself to the population by a... I think that to limit yourself only to audiences that uh, are interested in politics, traditional politics, like watching Newsnight and... Um, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm just a normal human being and they rang me up and said, do you want to go on Bake Off? And I was like, oh my God, I want to go on Bake Off, <laughs> yes! Um, and also I was, in town, I was actually in... Um, 
Burundi, on the border of Burundi and Tanzania when they emailed me in a refugee camp. And I said to some of the people I was with, oh my God, I've just got this email from Bake Off. And loads of the people in the refugee camp were like, oh, we watched that. <laughs> we wow. watched Bake Off. And so they were like, you've got to do it. You've got to go on Bake Off. But yeah, I think that so it the is. Refugees the refugees of Burundi, refugees of Burundi forced you into yeah. it. Yeah, people who'd left Rwanda 20 years ago and have been stuck there, you know, at least they have had Bake Off. Um, but... Um, yeah, I think that it's really ridiculous to be snobby and to limit yourself, but it is also incredibly risky uh, politically to do some of those things because especially if you're a woman, and I get this much more than Boris Johnson would ever get it, um, people will um, say that you're stupid and you're an attention seeker and the reason that you're doing it is um, all about you and Boris Johnson never had those things said about him. Mm. Um, although... All of them are true in his case. <laughs> That's um, him ringing now, I yeah. imagine. <laughs> um, and, um, but I think it is really important that you break beyond the traditional, uh, the traditional news programmes so that people can feel that politicians are real and that they are like them. The, one of the reasons that I went into politics was to convince people that politicians did you know, take their kids to school and get on the bus and go to hospital like you do and do the same things as you do because a lack of trust in our politicians and you, you, your Paxman, why are they so crap, is really, really, really dangerous. And actually, we're about to start seeing the fruition of how dangerous it is when people believe that it is people versus politicians and how that can be used to basically breed totalitarianism. So I think that anything that helps you reach across the aisle and speak mm. to people is really, really important. But isn't, I mean, when I did it, is it two days, three days of filming? Mm -hmm. Isn't that sort of time that could be potentially better spent with your constituents? Uh, or? Absolutely. It was no offence? No, 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 no offence taken. It was during the Tory party conference. So oh. one thing that we have in Parliament, so we're about to go back because there's nothing, nothing much going on at the moment. So it's obviously fine for us to be off for six weeks. Uh, and um, we're about to go back uh, on, I think, the 3rd of September is the first day back. And after two weeks of being in Parliament, and this happens every single September, you go on another three-week break for conference recess so that uh, all the political parties can have their um, conferences. And it's the Lib Dems first. And even though there's only, like, nine Lib Dems, we still get a week off Parliament for them to have a conference and then the Labour conference and then whoever's in government goes last, so it's the Tory conference. And so there's three more weeks of no legislation that goes on in that period. Mm -hmm. And actually, so I was uh, at Bake Off uh, for two of the days of the Tory party conference, and it was when Theresa May danced on the oh, stage, yes. and Noel was loving it, and we were doing the dance together in the tent. <laughs> um, but um, Do you think she'd be good on Bake Off? Theresa May? Yeah. No. She's, uh, I mean, she's the only person I've ever met who actually gives off cold air. She's, she's not very human. She's not very, she's not very... Um, she's like a crypt keeper, isn't she? She is. <laughs> sort of feel like she lives under a well. But do you know what? In her defence, in her defence, we don't all have to be... Um, either, you know, avuncular or um, charismatic on the television. We don't... Parliament doesn't... Shouldn't be full of people who all have the same skills and it sh we shouldn't criticise people who um, are cold and like a crypt keeper um, because it does need a variety of people and Theresa May would be crap on the telly and she... I mean, the whole wheat field thing is a really good example of how mm. she cannot show personality. But she was really studious and she had other skills. Um, it turns out one of them was not being the Prime Minister. Um, but um, <laughs> but I, I worry that people expect everybody to be the same in politics. And the whole point is, uh, the best line, I think, was somebody who was a total arsehole was in the bar in Parliament. I can't remember who it was. It was a Labour MP in the 80s. And um, they said, somebody came up to them and said, you know, you are an absolute arsehole, but using worse language. And uh, the, he said, well, there are a lot of arseholes in the country and they do deserve representing. <laughs> so... Can't argue with that. <laughs> Can't argue with that. So I We've all it, been to Wigan. I think it is important that we all... <laughs> we all have different... That, that not everybody's the same. So it's OK that she is cold and I am warm. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, are there any TV shows that you'd like to do that you've not done? Uh, well, Strictly? Any Strictly other? is would you? Uh, would totally. You? I wouldn't do it until I was not an MP anymore, right. though. You know, I would definitely... My friend Alex has... Uh, she thinks that I only became a politician in order to get on Strictly Come Dancing. Right. But it was a long game. <laughs> um, it's been heartbreaking uh, if that was the reason to do it. Um, but yeah, I would totally, just because you lose so much weight. They lose so much mm. weight, don't they? And their husbands. And <laughs> no, but my, I wouldn't lose my husband, definitely not. De no, definitely not. I mean, no. objectively, we talked about this. He is so fit. <laughs> So it, he's like, not Jess as fit is, as Ali Ash, though, is he? Is he? He's become, because you posted pictures of your husband on Instagram and he's yeah. become like an Instagram star. And he doesn't like that, does no, he? No, he absolutely hates it. My husband is the kind of person who's been preparing for the oncoming apocalypse for a long time. And mm. uh, he's a bit like Ron Swanson in Parks and Recreation in that he doesn't want any of his information anywhere on the internet. Yeah. He wouldn't like tell you, you know, he wouldn't tell you his address if you were to meet him. He probably wouldn't tell you his name. Um, and so, yeah, he really hates that he's become like an Instagram sensation for being a hottie. Mm. Although secretly, he likes it. Yeah, he definitely being called likes a hottie. it. Yeah. Um, panel shows. Would you do sort of comedy panel shows or? Well, I've done. Have I got news for you? Yeah. Um, and the whole time, I um, I remind myself that I they can't write legislation, and so I don't have to be a comedian. So no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't yeah. do. I wouldn't do, do like I'm not a comedian, kind of yeah. yeah. And people think I'm funny because the bar in Westminster is really, really, really low. Mm. Uh, and so people are like, oh my gosh, you're so funny. And I'm like, I'm really not that funny. It is just that... Um, well, you are. We've got a clip of you in uh, in the Houses of Com House of Commons, isn't it? Um, wherever it is you work. It's the and, Houses, um, of, houses, houses of, of Parliament. Houses of Parliament, and then the Commons is the within House of that, Commons, isn't it? Yeah, 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 whatever. Um, <laughs> Doing, but treating it like a stand-up gig. Let's see this clip. Did you prep that? Did you? No, I didn't even intend to speak um, <laughs> at all. I didn't. I went into. It was the immigration. Um, bill was the first uh, debate of the immigration bill, which stated that to be a skilled worker, you had to earn £30,000. And actually now, uh, Priti Patel and Boris Johnson are saying it has to be £36,000. Yeah. So it's gone up. Um, I wouldn't pay either of them 36 pence. Um, <laughs> but um, the there was some argy-bargy about whether the Labour Party was or wasn't going to support it. Mm. And I was like, what? Coming from Birmingham, I was a bit like, we can't be seen to be supporting this. Um, this is terrible. And so someone had texted me and just said, uh, can you get down to the immigration debate? I think we need to be making the argument that we're, we're against this. And we need people to say it so that the Labour Party whips here that we're going to vote against this. Um, so really, I was like in my office working and I just ran into the chamber. I didn't, had no intention of speaking, so I didn't prep it at all. It's effective, though, because we've got a, a still of the, uh, your fellow MPs pre this and they're all pretty, uh, pretty <laughs> chill, as you can see. And then after, as you're doing the sort of gags, essentially, the, there's the next still. They're <laughs> so engaged, so like it works. It, like, comedy does seem to be effective in, uh, oh. in those environments. Uh, I think that the use of comedy is the single greatest tool to connect with people in public meetings, in uh, any big forum, because when you're laughing with somebody, when some, it makes people feel like they're part of something and you're connected to them. And I suppose the observation uh, element of, you know, genuinely, I really thought that, I thought I was posh before I went to Parliament because, you know, I was shopping Waitrose. Mm. And genuinely, I had no idea that those sorts of people existed, that people who were that posh existed. And lots of people have had that experience and so they can laugh at their own experiences and you have then a shared um, thing. So, yeah, it's absolutely... It's really, really important to be able to make people laugh mm. uh, in order to put them at ease. And I do it with my constituents who are in terrible situations. Actually swearing... I think is really important way to communicate with people to make them trust yeah. you genuinely because everybody swears. Yeah. And if I sit with a, a constituent whose landlord is trying to evict them, it doesn't matter how prim they might be. I say, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to say this. This man sounds like a total wanker. And they feel like, oh, yeah, you know, he is. And you're a bit like me. Yeah. And if you make people laugh, then you're connected to them. Mm. So it's important to make people laugh.
Thanks, I try my best. Oh, you're doing um, a good job, Jen. Um, the, the point you were making on, I mean, both of those videos, well, the, that video, and then there's another um, time in the House of Commons when you, uh, it was on International Women's Day in mm -hmm. 2016, and you read out uh, the list of women murdered by men in 2015. Mm -hmm. Both of those went massively viral mm -hmm. and boosted you a lot. But they're terrifying things to bring up, I, I would feel, in, uh, how, how, where do you get the confidence from to sort of do those uh, speeches, particularly when... You haven't prepped for the, for the first one that we watched earlier. I mean, the bar is incredibly low again in the House of Commons for people who are actually good at public speaking. Um, so the, the, the reality is I am good at public speaking and I know I am good at it. Mm. I didn't know that when I arrived there. I had no idea. Um, but uh, I, I know what will reach people because I know people. I, I wanted to be a politician because I love people and I love the bizarre things they do even when I think that they're wrong. Um, I am uh, obsessed with sort of humankind and so you get the confidence by of talking about really difficult things sometimes, really hard things without any preparation because it's real. And the trouble is lots of the speeches that you'll see in the House of Commons, they will have been written by somebody else in the office who's got facts and figures about fisheries or transport or whatever. But I tend not to stand up and speak unless I am speaking about something I actually think mm. and I actually feel. Um, and I worked for years at Women's Aid, so I know that without question that I know what I am talking about when I talk about domestic abuse and um, the femicide. And I do it every year, talk about the femicide census. And you don't, the, you, you don't need to prepare when you've spent your whole life preparing because you spent your life working with homeless people or working with victims of domestic abuse. You know that what you're saying is right. What well, I'd be terrified if somebody said to me, you've now got to give a 20 minute lecture on I don't know, astrophysics. Mm. Like there was a time, oh, what's his name? Old Canadian president. Uh, oh God, what, the I handsome think of his name, the handsome one. That's him. Um, <laughs> oh, the handsome one, I know yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah, that's him. The one and only. And somebody asked him a physics question, he was like, well, actually, and then like knew the answer. Uh. Um, I couldn't do that. I'd be like, I don't know what that is. Um, but also I think that there's a disarming thing that you can do is when you're speaking honestly and from the heart, and that is to answer the question genuinely, honestly, and just say, I don't know if you don't know the answer. And mm. don't be afraid. Yeah. Don't be afraid of not knowing the answer. So if somebody intervenes on me during a speech and says, well, actually, what about this, that, and the other? I go, yeah, you might be right. Yeah. Not been my experience. Yeah. And that's okay. It's okay to be, to have flaws. Mm. Um, have, having that sort of, uh, as you describe it, like kind of normal approach to people. So we're both from Birmingham, mm -hmm. but I don't sound like it. Um, <laughs> I don't know how why, you've avoided why, it. Well, I went to a grammar school. So did um, I. Yeah. Which one? <laughs> the better one than the one you went to. We'll see about that. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't. I honestly don't think if I had a thick Brummie accent that I would have necessarily got as far as I did mm -hmm. in TV, particularly. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's helped or hindered you having your accent? When I was a kid, my dad, who actually taught Joe's dad at school, yeah, um, my dad used to really get on to me about my accent, even though he's got a broad Birmingham accent. What to get rid uh, of it? To get rid of it. Oh wow. Um, to, so because we say the oi sound wrong, so instead we say oi instead of i. So. Mm. You say sp spice, it sounds like you're saying space. Um, and my dad used to pick me up on it every day and it made me hate him a little bit uh, when I was a kid. Um, but he used to say to me, you'll never, you know, you'll never get ahead if you mm. have a Birmingham accent because people deride it. It's not right, but it is the way it is. But in reality, it has been the greatest asset to me to have a regional accent. Um, in oh, my political you, career, it is definitely... Do you think the country would accept a Brummie Prime Minister there? I mean, look at what we've got at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I'm all right for going to war. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, I think that they absolutely would uh, accept a Brummie Prime Minister. And in fact, the, like people always say to me, oh, you know, I don't always agree with you, but I like that you say what you think. And one of the reasons they think that I say what I think is because 
they trust me because I have a regional accent. It mm. is a really weird thing. Uh, and the Labour Party certainly, when I was first um, a candidate, put me on a pedestal because I was a woman with a regional accent. Um, and it was in the trying to distance everybody from being special advisors in Westminster and everything and getting the real people. So, yeah, it's been uh, like a massive um, boon to me. And But also there is a huge amount of class that people put onto it. Yeah. Like I say, I genuinely thought I was posh. I went to a grammar school and people will automatically assume that you're common because you have a regional accent. Mm. And I mean, like, it turns out I was quite common, but um, I just didn't know. <laughs> I just didn't know. Uh, but yeah, no, I think it's been a massive asset. But you think it would hold you back? Is that why you don't have one? Because your, no, never... you, your family, they sound more brummy than you. Mum's you... like RP and then my dad's a bit brummy, but none of the people I went to school with are brummy. And they've all got sort of speak like I do, really. But I also watched a lot of like Quentin Crisp when I was younger. So I think <laughs> I've just sort of absorbed that. I think that's how I've ended up with this ridiculous personality. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, if only they could have got the people on Peaky Binders to have Birmingham accents. Oh, God. I can't watch it. I can't. <laughs> it's horrible. I think I've got used to it now. Um, but at first I was a bit like, whoa. Mm. And he's my predecessor. Who? The Tommy Shelby is the MP for Birmingham Yardley. Is it? Oh, yeah. right. In so, the TV programme, sorry. Are there any other Not similarities? The last, last season. But he becomes the MP for the area that I represent. You so. slashed anyone up? Yeah, I, I got there by a similar means. I've ki <laughs> killed a few people. I've not watched the show, so I'm guessing they slash people up. Isn't that like what Like doing do? like weird jobs for Churchill, it seems to be, yeah, like hits for Churchill. I don't think it's historically accurate, <laughs> <laughs> is all I'm going to say. One thing that's going on in Birmingham, and actually it's starting to seep into the rest of the country, actually, is um, these protests, anti-LGBT mm -hmm. uh, protests outside schools. And you went down to the, is it Anderson, Anderson Park? Anderson Park, yeah. Um, and we've got a clip of you speaking to one of the protesters here. LAUGHTER That school isn't actually in your constituency, is it? It's no, it isn't. In my, in my constituency. It is in um, your constituency. But, so why did you? <laughs> Not the one Joe represents. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, fuck, I'm an MP. Um, uh, why, why did you feel that meant that you um, needed to go into somebody else's been, constituency? It had been going on for a number of um, weeks at a different school in, which is also not in my constituency, Park um, Field, which is. Uh, in like Hodgehill, Allen, Rockway. Um, and I had sort of kept out of that one because it wasn't in my constituency and I very much felt that the MP um, who represents there seemed very visibly to be working with the school and the community to make things better. So mm. I didn't feel like I had to. Um, but then the night before I rocked up at Anderton Park School, um, I'd had an email from the head teacher basically begging, saying that they felt like they'd been left alone by the Department for Education, by the members of parliament for the area, um, including myself. Yeah. She was like, I need help. And I was like, well, I will just come tomorrow. And I actually live like three streets away from Anderson Park um, Primary School. Um, so I was just like, oh yeah, I'll just drop my kids at school and I'll just come and see you and see what I can do to help. Mm. Um, and obviously they were all there, the protesters. My favourite bit, which he didn't share, is uh, when he says to me, where have you been? Why haven't you been down at this protest? You're not a very good representative. I was like, I'm not going to come to a protest I don't agree with. It's <laughs> just like really like accusatory. You should have been on the protest. I was like that. I'm not a bigot. <laughs> Why would I come to your protest? Um, it's really odd. Uh, but I felt like I had to uh, do something and because the MP for the area, unfortunately, I'm afraid to say, has mm. sided very much with the protesters um, and thinks that the children are too... Some children are too young to know that gay people exist. Uh, and at my children's school, which is probably the next school, the most local school to that school, there are gay mums and dad in the playground, there are gay children in the classrooms, and I just cannot Im imagine the idea that there are children in the school that are too young to know about their existence. Mm. I just don't agree with it. Um, and... But there is a lot of people in, certainly in places like Birmingham, especially representatives in places like Birmingham, people are really anxious about standing up against religious communities mm. um, and feel like you have to triangulate and, 
you know, play the percentages to make sure you can do the right thing. But the reality is there is right and wrong in this situation. One mm. is bigoted, is a bigoted opinion and one isn't. And I would stand on the picket line for the Muslim community where I live. So I will stand on the picket line for the LGBT community as well. What, what I particularly loved about it in that clip is the fact that you said to him that you're hurting the Muslim community, mm -hmm. which is exactly how I feel. And what I can't what worries it, me about it is um, I'm obviously invested because I am LGBT, but I had this amazing cab journey with a Muslim driver who um, I was off to actually to the protest for the uh, people's vote. And he said, oh, what are you up to? And I said, I'm going to this vote. And he said, oh, it's good you're doing that because it's taking up so much time, isn't it? All of this chat about Brexit when there are much bigger issues. Like they're saying that uh, it's all right to be gay in schools. And I was like, oh, oh God. Um, <laughs> And I was like, well, why'd you say that? And we started talking about it. And actually, <laughs> like anyone who has those sort of views, it, they fell apart quite quickly. And he said to me, he said, well, the, the anus isn't for having sex. And I said, well, have you ever had a blowjob? And he went, yeah. And I said, well, the, the mouth isn't really used for, meant for sex, is it? If you look at it like that. And he went, oh. And I went, I'll see you in hell. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he... Also, newsflash, heterosexual people have anal sex? Well, of course. And I said, well, I've actually never had. I said to him, I said, I've never actually had anal sex. <laughs> but now and... it's like me and Jerry in our living room. Yeah. <laughs> but I haven't. I said, I've never had anything up there. And he went, <laughs> and he went oh, so you're a top and high-fived me. <laughs> so so he, he knew what these things were, but didn't... And actually, we both came away and we were both... He'd loved a laugh, I'd had a laugh, and yeah. we both sort of agreed to disagree. And he'd said, well, my religion says this and whatever, and it was sort of fine. Oh, yeah. But actually, coming away from it, I thought, well, actually, we, neither of us have changed our views. No. And I'm definitely not going to change mine. So I don't actually see what, what the, is the solution to that problem. Is there a solution? Um, I think that there is a solution, and we live in a rules-based system, um, and Parliament legislates for the rules of this country and actually what I have found representing a, a in lots of cases conservative with a small c because they're certainly not conservative with the big c uh, Muslim community um, is that if there are rules mm. um, like you have to teach every part of the Equality Act uh, about every in every school to every child th it will be accepted yeah that that is the rule, that is the way that is. What the government have done and what has caused the trouble in this instance is that they've allowed this sort of fudge because they listen to religious communities. And funnily enough, it wasn't the Muslim community they were listening to at the time when they made this fudge. It was other religious communities mm. um, where it's up to the head teacher to decide. And all that means is that head teachers across the land can have pressure put on them. Yeah. So the, the solution is a rules-based system. And all of the people I grew up with, all of the people in my constituency will carry on living by the rules just as much as they ever have. Um, but it's when the government gets nervous. We're all so nervous and we live in this time where we're so nervous to try and just do the right thing. And that is that is really dangerous, in my opinion. And as somebody who lives uh, and has always lived in a really, really mixed community, and it pisses me off about Brexit and the white working class community, the th same thing gets said about them, as if, um, as if these people can't have a debate, as if they're gonna shatter like a million pieces mm. if you go, well, I just don't agree with you, mate. Like, you know, I mean, my family, we don't agree with each other on anything, but we still love each other. And we row and white working class communities can have a debate about things. Mm. Why do we think we get so precious that we can't say things anymore or think that people can bear a debate and it, that way lies madness and unfortunately it will be taken advantage of by totalitarianism and very, very radical views. Mm. Um, now, I've got another one of your, a clip of uh, what some call a media stunt, I suppose, and this is when um, you took your son Danny mm -hmm. to 10 Downing Street to mm -hmm. protest against the closing of schools. Um, so, uh, the lovely Katie Hopkins watched that and she, um, <laughs> she said on Twitter, imagine if a right-wing MP used their child for a media stunt. The government do not have a responsibility to look after our children. Parents do. Schools have a responsibility to teach maths, English and unrevised history. Take a shower, Jess Phillips. <laughs> um, is it a media stunt? It was right there. I was a bit sweaty. 
To be fair to Katie Hopkins, <laughs> she got that right. Yeah. I definitely needed some Batiste on the old fringe. <laughs> definitely. I'll give her that. Uh, was she right in what she said? Well, what, uh, was it a media stunt? I mean... Yes, of course it was a bloody media stunt. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really genuinely take him there to, yeah. for childcare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I absolutely love about the response of quite a lot of the right-wing uh, press was the idea that, I mean, lots of people said, well, you can afford to pay for childcare. And I was just like, well, you know, I don't just represent myself. I represent a community of people. There's 122,000 people who live in my constituency. Um, and also people were sort of like, oh, well, you shouldn't have kids if you can't afford them. In, in this ridiculous way that, of just accepting that universal education for five days a week was a luxury, not something that we'd all completely and utterly accepted as being the total norm. Mm. And we have to be really, really careful in this country uh, that when things are lost, we just get used to the fact that they never existed mm. and our standards slip and people will keep on pushing the envelope. And I wanted to stand up and say, as a mother whose children now can't go to school on a Friday afternoon, that isn't acceptable. But of course it was a media stunt. But and it on. worked, didn't it? It was on the front of the New York Times. In your face, Katie Hopkins. <laughs> <laughs> da Danny wasn't entirely helpful that day. <laughs> Danny is the worst lobbyist in the world. Uh, sorry, Dan. Uh, he's, he's down there on the front row, um, by the way. But yeah, so the first time we, when his class size went up from 30 to 32, I introduced him. We, he was down in Westminster for the day and I introduced him to Justin Greening, who was then the Education Secretary of State. And I said, Danny, this is Justine. Why don't you tell her about how many more children there are in your class? And Danny was like, yeah, more mates. And I was like, oh, <laughs> ah, ah, this isn't helpful. And then uh, after they'd announced that his school was going to shut on Fridays, we bumped into Nick Gibb, the school's minister. And I said, Danny, tell Nick all about how you can't go to school on a Friday. And Danny was like, yes. <laughs> but this is not on message, Danny. And yep. the government should not be taking advice from a 10-year-old. Uh, but, yeah, and on the day, poor Danny was just like, you know, in the front of the world's media. Uh, he was just sort of like, I don't know. Yeah, I suppose it's bad. <laughs> but he, he made the point. We, um, you uh, used to, I remember there was a time where you didn't have your kids on, yep. like you'd blur them out of social media posts and all of mm -hmm. that. So what changed with this? What, why were you um, okay with him being in the press then? I think that as my children have got older, there's, there's a common wisdom that was said to me by other uh, politicians um, as I became a member of parliament is that if you don't put your children in the limelight, if you don't put them on the leaflets and you don't talk about them, um, the press will leave them alone. It's the sort of fair game element of it. Um, and I really took that to heart. And my husband was really, really strict uh, for a long time about the fact that uh, they couldn't be on anything. And, and, and But then I, when I got to Parliament, I think that there has been a bit of a sea change in Parliament where people do talk much more about their own lives and their own experiences, which has been really good. And people talking about their mental health, people talking about uh, their coming out. There's now an MP who's... Uh, come out as having HIV and that's really positive that the whole normalizing our politics has been going on and I just found that I talked about my kids all the time and my children genuinely have the experience of the children in my constituency whose schools are shutting they have not got enough teachers in their school they're, they're, there's kids in their class who can't afford uh, to carry on going to school through home to school transport because their special educational needs of uh, budgets have been cut. It is affecting their lives. And as a feminist, the politics has always been personal. The personal is the political. That has always been the case. And to sort of eliminate my children from my dialogue just seemed, it seemed unsustainable for a long time. Now, whacking them on the front of every newspaper is different. And mm. it took a huge amount. But ultimately, I asked him and he said he wanted to do it. And this, nobody would have picked it up, actually, the story about the, the schools being cut those hours, had he not done that. Mm. And so sometimes you've got to sacrifice your children's future. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> to, you know, make the point for other children, because he'll probably be all right. His mum's an MP. Well, I, uh, actually, I met with Danny earlier in the week um, to ask him if he had any questions that he wanted you to answer. <laughs> And I've got them. Well, I've actually I, I, I met with both of your children and your husband, and they've all got questions, actually. And then my husband came into me afterwards and said, you really, this is a terrible mistake, Jess. 
Well, Danny's question is, can I have a tenner? <laughs> The answer is no. Uh, not an, no. Yeah, I need I need a chitty always to hold over him, so no. He's not got really been good. He's got three others. What's your favourite ice cream? Pistachio. Is that right? Is that the right answer? That yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, why are your politics so boring? <laughs> um, it's a good question, really. It is, uh, um, for lots of people, politics is really boring, isn't mm. it? I can't really answer that, Danny. I'm only really sorry that the politics is so boring. Danny has to sit in lots of very boring meetings. Mm. Uh, I remember the first time we ever came to a Labour Party meeting with me, he genuinely thought because of the word party that there would be like cake. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, that, that was the worst party I have ever been to. <laughs> like, you know, motions about Venezuela. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's not, it's, it is very, very boring, I think, to be the child of a politician, actually. Uh, final one from Danny. Why don't you like chocolate hobnobs? <laughs> this is a massive, that is a great question. That is a massive point of contention in my house because everybody else likes them and I hate them. They taste like... Hate chocolate hobnobs? I, Fuck off. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't hate them like I hate sweet corn. I would... T actually, maybe I do. I find them intolerable. And I find them intolerable what? because they are the only biscuit my husband ever buys from the shop. Uh, and, um, I mean, they're chocolate hobnobs are better than just hobnobs. Hobnobs taste like grit. <laughs> they are horrible. You haven't eaten grit. <laughs> <laughs> they are uh, horrible. They're just horrible. Are you happy with that? I'm not happy with that. They are disgusted. You're not happy. I'm going to adopt you. <laughs> you can't be near this woman anymore. My mum genuinely said to me, you should never marry somebody who doesn't like Marmite and does like Palm of Islets. With that Venn diagram. Good advice. Yeah. Oh, I've stuck with that. And my brother actually did not uh, heed that advice and he is now divorced. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, this is a question from... I want to know what this is. Um, from your other son, Harry, your eldest son. Why do you eat quavers in the bath? <laughs> what does that so, mean? Um, so Harry and his friend, in their wisdom, changed my Wikipedia page to say <laughs> that I ate quavers in the bath right um and were appalled when wikipedia took it down and told harry that he was not a reliable source <laughs> uh and that he had no citation he had no citation to prove that i ate quavers in the bath uh, harry gets very annoyed because sometimes when people tell this story they make out like i've had a bath of quavers which is an entirely different thing i just eat quavers in the bath um and uh yeah in fact so I then mentioned it on Twitter uh, and a charity that apparently tries to stop fake news uh, got in touch and said it's actually really important that you don't teach your children to put fake things on Wikipedia uh, and <laughs> called him called him something like, I can't even remember what it was, like a bandit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> said he was amoral. Talking about my, my like 14 year old son, what did what they it? say? A notorious, a notorious vandal, vandal, that was it. A notorious <laughs> vandal, yeah. A notorious vandal, which Harry's now going to have put on a T-shirt. Yeah. Um, and so then I wrote an article in the um, New Statesman where I cited it so that Harry would have a citation <laughs> to put it on Wikipedia. So you used so, this. so I used my own <laughs> platform to allow my notorious vandal of a son to make up a lie to put on Wikipedia about how I eat quavers in the bath. And is that now on your Wikipedia page? I'm not sure that they've accepted it yet, oh, right. but they will. It's got they a citation. Will. Let's get it up there. Um, and the question from your husband, Tom, and then we'll try and get through a couple of them from the audience. Um, why can't you leave the house without slamming the door? <laughs> it sounds like you're going to pull it off the hinges. Just shut it. <laughs> <laughs> I but, think he might leave me over this one day. I don't think I'm doing anything. I just think I'm pulling it too. Mm. Sometimes I'm annoyed with him. Maybe, and then I'm shutting it. Right. And we have got security doors because of the threats and stuff that I get. Um, and I just, they're annoying, and I feel like I have to make sure that they're shut. But, I mean, equally, I know he's not here to defend himself, but why does he never lock the fucking doors? <laughs> I swear to God, if you want to break into my house, pick a day when I'm not there. I mean, he never locks the doors. What, at, at all? At night time, that... he's like, probably be all right. I mean, he's terrible. He's genuinely awful. So we, we need to meet somewhere in the middle. I'm very secure and he right. is not secure at all. He just thinks everything will be all right. Like all brummies, he's like, probably be all right. Yeah, be fine. Yeah. Got loads of chapati flour, you're going to be all yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, let's have a look at um, some questions. We've only got a couple of minutes. Uh, Johnson and Corbyn both habitually duck TV interviews. Mm -hmm. What's your take on politicians' responsibility to speak to broadcasters? I Very TV festival question, that. I think that they have a responsibility to uh, speak to broadcasters. Although, you know, I would be lying if I said that it doesn't, sometimes your words don't get completely and utterly twisted uh, to mean something that you didn't mean at all. And so I can understand why people avoid it. Both of them tout themselves as being plain speaking and honest and um, have in the past felt very comfortable in front of TV cameras um, to answer the question and feel that they could do it. So when they don't, when they know that people won't like their answers, they just duck it. Mm. Um, and I think that they do have a responsibility to answer questions. The media has a really, really, really important role in our democracy, really much more important than people recognise. Uh, in fact, and some of the whole uh, MSM, anti-mainstream media, and I genuinely, when I first saw MSM, thought it meant men who have sex with men, because I just think, why are all these people in the Labour Party hate gay people? Because <laughs> they're like the dangerous MSM, because I used to work in sexual health and that was yeah. the code for it, <laughs> MSM. Uh, and I think that it's, um, I think it's, I think it, it's dangerous to, and Trump does it, mm. to deride broadcasting which is there to hold you to account so they should go on it i don't know why they keep ducking it because they don't have anything to say maybe mm. uh we've got time for one more oh this um no, i love this one whoever sent this in with channel 4 choosing leeds over birmingham for its hq <laughs> and very few indies in the city do you think tv tends to forget that the midlands exists yes i do think that me too uh, disgracefully, I think, actually. Um, I was gutted when Channel 4 didn't... Uh... Leeds? It's absolute shit off. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, I went to university there, so I've got a slight soft spot for it, but yeah. only slight. Mm. Fleeting. Um, what's good's come out of Leeds? <laughs> Mel B. That's all I can think of. <laughs> Literally the only person I can think of from Leeds. Yeah, that's true, Mel B. Um, well, it's got that. Yeah, I think it's terrible the way that um, the Midlands is largely forgotten in, uh, and even talking about Peaky Blinders, it's not filmed in Birmingham. It's not made in Birmingham. I think the only time I ever see Birmingham actually on the television is on the news, or um, is I, the, there used to be a drama that was based in London, but clearly it was cheaper to film in Birmingham. And I used to be like, that is not, um, that is not London, that is Birmingham. And Steven Spielberg put it in that Ready Player One. The loads of it was filmed in Douglas, wasn't mm. it? it? It's doctors. It, we filmed doctors. Of course, there. we have doctors. That's true. Have you ever been on it? Like no. I feel like everybody in their childhood. Were you ever on Brum as a as a? Uh... Oh no, I loved that show. What though. about Woof? I mean, honestly, you were not in the extra scene when you were a kid. No, no. Tom's been a. My husband has been a climbing instructor on Doctors. Was big in Brum. I think he was often a kid in Brum. Had to be in it so all the, br time. the Brum's a little car, the little brum, car yeah. thing, and woof about a boy who becomes a dog. We were all in that. I mean, that was when they used to make TV in Birmingham. Obviously, um, I think it's terrible, and uh, I think it derides. Uh, there is a huge amount um, wrong with the fact that the way that the world is represented is so London centric. Mm. Um, in almost every regard, there, there is so much culture that gets missed. There is a lack of understanding of, I mean, when anybody who woke up on the day of the Brexit vote and was surprised by the result, there is a responsibility to those who give us a window into the world that we all missed something for a reason. Mm. And there are real lives and real stories that need to be much, much better presented. Um, and that is a class thing as much as anything else. There needs to be a far... I feel that when I was a kid in the 80s, and my husband always says Tory governments do one thing is they make the music good and the telly good. Um, that when I was a kid in the 80s, the representation of working class people in both, in almost every culture was way, way better than it is today. It was people's real lives, like stuff like Boys from the Black stuff, stuff written by Carla Lane, bread. These people were proud people who were allowed to be funny and clever and know about politics. And there is a huge amount of the way that stories get told now about people's class that is either voyeuristic or people from outside of London uh, that is either voyeuristic or basically 
exploitative, and mm. I think that that has got to change. We're out of time. Um, you're amazing. Uh, you're please, amazing. Please join me in thanking the brilliant Jess Phillips. Thank you.